Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Brendan Kelly, and I have the privilege and pleasure of serving as the chancellor here at the University of South Carolina Upstate. And welcome to the 13th annual research symposium at this university. I have been here 45 days, <laughs> and a lot of things have pleased me in that amount of time, uh, including uh, getting a chance to meet so many wonderful contributors to this community. But I could not be more pleased to have learned that we've been hosting this event for the last 13 years. You know, it is our responsibility as universities to create knowledge and understanding. And there is no more efficient and effective way than to get undergraduate students and high school students, any person at any point in their educational career involved in research. Because when we say that term, it sounds intimidating and it sounds like something somebody else should be doing. But it isn't. I've watched so many students over the course of my educational career be transformed by the ability to go and investigate and experiment and create something, some new understanding or discovery for humanity to enjoy and progress with. Having a conference, an interdisciplinary conference that represents more than 20 universities from as far away as the University of Kentucky is a wonderful and, and joyous occasion to celebrate today, including all of the students who are coming from uh, high school to get involved in this element of higher education early. There's a lot of people to thank to make this happen because as much as you might assume that we are always set up to just have hundreds of people here to celebrate, uh, undergraduate research and, and other forms of professional study. We are not. Coffee usually is not available in this room. I want to thank, there's a, a whole series of sponsors uh, to certainly thank for making this a reality. Without that type of support, we don't get a chance to host events like this and to make our institution better, our community better. Additionally, there is a program committee uh, that spans many institutions to bring this event together. And that's the way almost every academic conference in the United States is hosted and, and certainly around the world. We bring uh, knowledge from different institutions together so that we can create uh, opportunities to study. Uh, and the contributions of that program committee are vital. Uh, while it hasn't occurred yet, we're going to thank the judges in advance since they have a lot of work to do in evaluating uh, the work as well as the session chairs. You're going to see a number of people in gray shirts walking around. One of them is Kip. He's sitting in front of me. Kip's a biology major, and he wants to go to medical school. I say that just because 100% of the biology majors that we've graduated in the last two years who have applied to medical school are now in medical school. I say that just to take every opportunity to brag about the University of South Carolina Upstate any chance I get. Additionally, uh, we want to thank uh, our guest speaker. We have a keynote speaker, Dr. James Porter. Dr. James Porter is from the University of Georgia, but ladies and gentlemen, what you didn't know when you walked in here is he is not just a mere academic. He doesn't just sit around and study biology and the ecology of coral. He is a movie star. <laughs> Dr. James Porter's film, Chasing Coral, just won the Sundance Film Festival. In midsummer, you will be able to watch Chasing Coral on Netflix. Now, I know there are a lot of young people in this room who say, on Netflix, that means I get to watch it for free. <laughs> but that's not true. Your parents pay for that. And eventually, <laughs> you will have to, too. So if you'd like an autograph, he will be the professor in sunglasses with security. Thank you for being here, Dr. Porter. There's one final person uh, to thank for making this, uh, this conference a reality, and that's Dr. Melissa Pilgrim. Uh, she, has, she is her worst enemy because she keeps coming up with great ideas. And I keep saying, that's a great idea. Why aren't we doing that? And she says, because I have to do it. And I mean, that's still a great idea. <laughs> And this is certainly a product of that work. So ladies and gentlemen, if you will join me in thanking her for her work.
I hope this conference is a great and transformative experience for you, and welcome to the University of South Carolina Upstate. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me in the back, Vlad? All right. Um, I want to kind of say ditto to all the thank yous. This is not possible without an army of people, and you do not know how indebted and how grateful I am for all of the help. Um, part of my job today, right, in, in addition to those thank yous, is to introduce Dr. Porter. Um, I get rather humbled by that because the man impresses me, okay, <laughs> to, to be, you know, quite honest. Um, obviously, his work, his research is outstanding top-notch. He's received much acclaim for it, right? But I'd like to at least briefly mention the person he is because he's an outstanding human, okay? Part of why I was so thrilled he said yes um, is how much he genuinely enjoys sharing his work, which is kind of what we're all here and what we're all about today, right? And the importance of sharing what we do. His work crosses disciplines, but near and dear to my heart, he loves students. The amount of respect I have for all that he is, is hard to find words for. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Porter. Well, what, a, what an introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about a, an issue that is very broad in its implications. I wonder if we could have the lights down just a little, that, that would be nice. And it concerns the environmental legacy of war, human and environmental health concerns on Vieques, Puerto Rico. Now, my research specialty is coral reefs. And I'm not going to talk specifically about them today, but in a general way, some of the assaults that are occurring to them. I'm going to talk to you about the true costs of war the kind of thing that you rarely hear about, but that you should. I'm going to talk to you about war and its effect on biodiversity of the planet. I'm going to talk to you about war and ecotoxicology, which has become my specialty the last few years. Not a linear route to get from systematics of the lower invertebrates to uh, the ecology of war. But I also want to talk to you about ethical issues and the conduct of research. The things that all of you in this room are engaged in now and will be engaged in for the rest of your lives. First of all, regarding the costs of war, we all know the human, financial, and political costs of war. These are large, they are well reported in the news, and we hear about them, and we hear about them daily as a result of the activities that are occurring across this planet. But today I want to focus on the one that you don't hear much of, but that you should hear a lot of, and that is the environmental and human health impacts of war. And not just war, but the conduct of war and the training and preparation for war. All of these things have an impact on the environment. First of all, let's look a little bit more at the costs of war. Currently, the Defense Department budget is $1 trillion per year. Now, that number is so large it's hard to understand. But let's put it in perspective. That is equivalent to a thousand environmental protection agencies. We could have 1,000 environmental protection agencies for what we're spending on war and the preparation for war. We could have 300 national park services, 300 more parks than we currently have. Or we could have 100 national science foundations. Imagine 100 national science foundations would be possible with this kind of funding. This is equivalent to 100% of all the room, board, and tuition of every student in this country could be paid. You would have no debts, no costs, nothing if we were studying these kinds of things instead of spending it on war. 6% of all materials consumed in the world are consumed and produced for war or the preparation for war. And that means that 10% of all global carbon emissions are due to this activity. That's 10% of our temperature rises, 10% of our inclement weather, 10% of sea level rise is due to war. War, 
causes climate change. War causes climate change. And 15 million square kilometers of land are affected. That's 17% of Kazakhstan is uninhabitable, and nearly 20% of Vietnam is covered by landmines and is also uninhabitable. Now, let's look a little bit about its effect on biodiversity. Currently, the Earth has uh, what are called biodiversity hotspots. <clears throat> this is only 2.3% of the Earth's surface. However, within that tiny sliver of land, the 2.3% are 50% of all plant species and 40% of all animal species. That's an amazing concentration of the diversity of life forms on this planet. And yet, within this area, over the last 60 years, 90% of all wars have been fought within our biodiversity hotspots. So what is that really equivalent to? That would be equivalent to saying in the future we will have all wars fought on the grounds of the Louvre, the Moscow, the Getty, or the Guggenheim. That's where we're going to drop our munitions and fight our wars. Or equivalent in terms of our culture, we would say that in the future we're going to fight all of our wars in Machu Picchu and Korwat Tikal or the Great Pyramids of Giza. We will take our natural resources, we will take our heritage, and we will fight all our wars there. And in fact, we're doing quite a bit of that. This is Angkor Wat and demining. And as we know, with the kinds of things that ISIS has done in the Middle East, those sorts of cultural uh, destructions are not really outside the capability of what human beings do. So a few years back, I got a very strange call from the governor's office in Puerto Rico who said, Dr. Porter, would you like to come to Puerto Rico and study our coral reefs? Well, I'm thinking I am brer rabbit and I am being tossed in the briar patch. And I said, well, exactly where do you want me to do these surveys? I'll be happy to come. He said, Vieques. Well, I've lived and worked my entire career for the last 45 years in the Caribbean, and I had absolutely no idea where that was. However, Vieques is the size of an island I'm sure everyone will have heard of, which is St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. But for the last 60 years, Vieques has been used as a target range by the US and allied forces as they practice for the, the conduct of war. So the first thing we did was to use standard EPA coral reef transects that we had originated in the state of Florida. Here's Cary's Fort Reef in the Florida Keys, the, uh, one of the very most diverse coral reefs in that region. There are 11 species within the 20 square meter transect, belt transect. Rock Key, 15. Sand Key off Key West has 19 species. But look at, look at Vieques, Puerto Rico. Within a standard EPA transect, there were 24 species of corals. And what that means is that the Vieques coral reefs are the most biodiverse environments under U.S. protection, the most biodiverse marine areas under U.S. protection, and that is where we went to practice for war. We went to our biodiversity hotspot to practice for war. So the assignment from the governor's office in Puerto Rico was rather straightforward. Oftentimes, these assignments are rather straightforward. You students should understand that. That's part of life, doing simple things. They asked, could you survey the coral reefs of Vieques and determine the environmental impact of military activity there? So off we went. And what we learned was that on Vieques, they had dropped between 20 and 30,000 bombs over the last 60 years. And because of that, we knew that they had dropped a half trillion pounds of high explosives on that island and its associated coral reefs. A half trillion pounds of high explosives. Well, we flew to Vieques, and it's a beautiful place, but I had heard of its reputation. So I asked the US Navy, is it safe? 
I mean, you've got to ask that. And the Navy wrote me back, and they said, there are no bombs on Vieques coral reefs. Oh, whew, thank heavens. So a half a minute over the side of the boat. <clears throat> <laughs> so one of the things that you know about the natural world, we could actually see this from the surface. We knew there were problems there because we saw when we looked down on this natural environment, we saw straight lines the outlines of these bombs. There are no straight lines in nature. These bombs are so common they can be seen from the surface. And they are leaking and corroding as well. This is a Mark 84 2,000 pound general purpose airdropped munition. Uh, I started to learn the taxonomy of things that I would have preferred not to know. So we put in our report and I'm sitting in front of my television and watching the 6 o'clock news, and all of a sudden, I have become the 6 o'clock news. Here you're going to hear from PBS a debate between Paul Wolfowitz, Deputy Secretary of Defense, and Annabella Rodriguez, who's the Secretary of Justice at, uh, in Puerto Rico. In this, I want you to listen to how Annabella Rodriguez responds to the suggestion from the Department of Defense that because she is raising issues about her environment, that she is unpatriotic. Listen to how she describes the men and women of the armed forces from Puerto Rico and the contribution that they have made to the defense of our nation and listen to the context in which she puts the research on which I am reporting. Well, let me first of all state to you and to the Vice uh, Secretary that the people of Puerto Rico take very seriously all the matters related to national defense, and we have done so throughout our history. Uh, per capita, Puerto Ricans are amongst the highest in the United States as it relates to volunteering in the, ar in the armed forces, as it relates to dying in the battlefield, and as to receiving the Congressional Medal of Honor because of their bravery. So I don't think this is a question of whether or not the Puerto Ricans really uh, do not put the weight that should be placed on national defense, on national readiness. This is basically uh, for us a question of human rights, the health of our people, of our children, and of our environment. As recently as a year and a half ago, there was a study by a scientist from the University of Georgia by the name of Professor Potter, and it, he has in his study determined the serious environmental effects to the coral reefs of Puerto Rico because of the, uh, in, all the bombs that are laying there on our pristine waters. So to us, it's a matter of human rights. To us, it is a matter of human rights. I'm going to twist the uh, Homeland Security moniker just a little bit and put it in a new context for you. You are learning new things. You're discovering your environment. You are beginning to know things. And what I want all of you to do in life, when you know something, say something. Speak up. So we decided we would go back to Puerto Rico, to Vieques, and study this environment more. And we took samples from the bomb at increasing distances out onto the coral reef. This is <clears throat> my hand. And this is TNT, Semtex, C4 compound. Uh, probably something they say that you shouldn't try uh, on your own. But we wanted to take the samples, and so we did. And we cataloged everything that we took. We took the scientific approach to finding out what was going on. The first thing we noticed is that every organism in physical contact with the bombs were sick. And you can see in this reef building coral, this is the natural color. This is the color it had turned. And so we sampled the coral. Now this graph is somewhat complex, but let me run through it. Whenever you see a red bar, it means that that 
toxic material is carcinogenic with respect to EPA's risk-based level for carcinogens. So we sampled the water near the bomb. It's carcinogenic for hexahydro 135 trinitro, 135 trinitrobenzene, carcinogenic, 13 dinitrobenzene, carcinogenic, 246 trinitro toluene, very carcinogenic. Does anybody know what uh, trinitro toluene is called? TNT, a lot of it there. 2,4 dinitrotoluene carcinogenic, 2 trinitrotoluene carcinogenic, almost 100,000 times more carcinogenic than allowed by EPA's values. 100,000 times more concentrated than is allowable. This stuff is toxic, and these are conventional munitions. These are bombs underwater. With respect to the coral, the same thing, carcinogenic in this case for four of these compounds. With respect to feather duster worms, carcinogenic for these three and presence of other compounds here, but not at those levels. And if we look at sea urchins, carcinogenic for TNT, this is an important one because the Puerto Ricans wanted to collect the row, the eggs from the sea urchin and ship them to Japan where they could make more than $500 a kilogram for that stuff, but no, that can't be shipped because it's carcinogenic. And finally, with regards to the fish, it had these materials at the base of the food chain. It's there. Now, here are the general principles that we learned from this study. The concentrations of these materials were greater when you were close to the bomb and much lower when you moved away from the bomb. They were more concentrated from stationary organisms attached to the seafloor than for mobile organisms. And we see that because the coral, which was near and stationary, had the highest uh, concentration. And fish, which were farther away and mobile, had the lowest concentration. So that is the general principle that involves here. Now, it has several implications. First of all, these explosive compounds are never found in the natural world. So we're not talking about things, toxic materials like arsenic or lead or cadmium. These are materials that only human beings make. They were never on this planet prior to what we did. Now, from one and only source, so we know who the polluter is, from one and only source, munitions, they are found everywhere on the reef. They have gone throughout the entire ecosystem. Now, last year, uh, Dr. Rosen uh, repeated this study because, <clears throat> let me tell you, the Department of Defense was not at all pleased <laughs> with the study that we published. So they, they said, let's repeat it. Porter's got to be wrong. Well, he found the same thing we did, which is that concentrations were high where there were munitions and low where they were not. Now, I show you this additional piece of science because you have to understand that one study makes opinion. Two studies make science. You've got to have your work confirmed. You've got to split your samples. You've got to do it more than once. So I decided it was time, since I knew something, to say something. So I went to Washington, D.C., and I worked with Robert Kennedy, Jr. here on my right, who was very interested in Vieques and Congressman Acevedo Villa here. Puerto Rico does not have a vote in the U.S. Congress, but it has someone called a resident commissioner whose office is in the Rayburn Building, and he is informed of any legislation that relates to Puerto Rico, even though he cannot vote on it, but he still has a voice in Congress, and so we talked to him. And in part because of the research you've just seen, on, in May of 2002, the U.S. Navy left the island of Vieques, stopped bombing there. And in January 2005, we got the Environmental Protection Agency to declare Vieques a Superfund site. We then sat back and we expected that the Navy would clean it up. Superfund site had the money. It was time to go. But in fact, absolutely, Nothing was done. And last year, a physician in San Juan released information on Vieques human health and mortality, showing that uh, Viecans die at 30% higher from cancer, 45% higher from diabetes, chirosis of the liver, um, 
and this is liver disease after the alcoholics were removed from the survey, um, and heart disease 381%, and you're going to hear the CNN report that was done in part based on the work I'm showing you. And now a CNN special investigation, an island paradise turned toxic, where today thousands of Americans have cancer and other crippling diseases. The people living there blame the U.S. military because for decades it used part of their island for weapons testing. Abby Boudreaux of CNN's Special Investigations Unit has the story. These images, recorded five years ago by University of Georgia scientists, show the former bombing range and surrounding waters strewn with unexploded ordnance. According to the UGA scientists, many of those bombs continue to corrode, leaching out carcinogens. The Environmental Protection Agency in 2005 designated parts of Vieques a Superfund toxic site. The U.S. government's response to the Islanders' lawsuit is to claim sovereign immunity, that residents have no right to sue the government. The population of Vieques is by far the sickest human, human population that I've ever worked with. These people are very sick, very early, and dying earlier. So something is happening there. Dr. Carmen Ortiz is a Harvard-trained epidemiologist and a physician in San Juan. It's astonishing. They die 30% higher of cancer, 45% higher of diabetes, 95% higher of liver disease, and 381% higher of hypertension than the rest of Puerto Ricans. Sixteen-year-old Coral is the eldest of Nanette's two daughters, both battle cancer. She had removed half of her stomach and her intestines, partly, almost everything, it's plastic. How do you feel right now? Sometimes I feel sad because, you know, everybody calls me plastic intestines. They say, oh, you stuck plastic belly. And I tell them, you know what? If you were in this condition, how would you feel? Yeah. Coral so showed us what she lives baby. with every day. Mm -hmm. So you can see how I feel when everybody teases me. I have my little cousin that died of cancer. I have my sister that has, has cancer. My boyfriend's mom died of cancer. Abby, it is hard to watch yeah. these young people, what they're going through. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. Appreciate it. So you've heard the numbers about human health on the island. And the Navy's response was to do two things. First of all, <clears throat> they said the islanders shouldn't be able to sue them. And they claimed sovereign immunity where you're not allowed to sue the island, to sue the Navy. The other thing they did is they withheld 100% of all the EPA Superfund site money to clean it up because, they said, they could do this because Puerto Rico is a commonwealth and not a state. There were no base closure funds when the Navy left, no environmental cleanup. It is the only U.S. base that has ever been closed for which those funds were not given to the people of Vieques and the people of Puerto Rico. Now, remember what the Attorney General said per capita. There are more Puerto Ricans serving in the U.S. military than any state in the Union. More Puerto Ricans die on the battlefield defending our freedoms than any other state, and more receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for their bravery than any other state. And for this, the Department of Defense claims sovereign immunity. We don't need to do anything. Needless to say, <clears throat> the people of Puerto Rico did not listen to the suggestion that they would not be allowed to s sue the federal government, and they have decided to sue anyway. And this is the people of Vieques versus the United States of America, and uh, Coral Rosa is one of the defendants in this, as is another man here, um, Hermogenes Montero, which you will hear from. Now, this man was extremely sick, and as a result, Sergeant Marrero was asked to give a deposition so that his testimony could be part of this if it took a long time 
to get to the Supreme Court, and you are going to hear in this deposition from Sergeant Marrero. Now, in addition to the voices of uh, Sergeant Marrero and uh, the attorney of record, John Eaves, you're also going to hear from the U.S. Department of Justice and from the Ministry of Justice again. These were representing the United States. They're in the room every once in a while. You're, you'll hear them trying to object to what he's saying, but you're going to hear him overvoice them because he's, been, he's getting sick and tired of being told to stop talking, and he wants to get the word out. Now, in this, you're going to realize that Sergeant Murrow is of limited education. That doesn't matter. He was sent for training for chemical weapons and munitions, and normally, chemical weapons are identified by use of an auto analyzer and a mass spectrometer. Clearly, Sergeant Murrow is not able to do that, but his training did allow him to identify these materials um, based on container markings, I note these too, and also handling procedures. Now I should tell you in advance that the Department of Defense has said that every word you are going to hear from Sergeant Marrero is an absolute, total fabrication and lie. Now Sergeant Marrero does get um, you know, retirement benefits from his service. He had been suing for disability benefits based on the illnesses that he says was caused by his protection of these kind of materials. I want to draw your attention to four important points which caught our interest. He mentions four things specifically, the kind of things that somebody can say, well, you're lying, but he, it was so specific that you had to say, now, wait a minute, I need to know more about this. But here we have Project Shad, Project 112. I mean, that's getting pretty specific. And you'll also hear him say he's identifying mustard gas as a liquid, not a gas, and he's talking about pressure release. Now, the, the DOD said, oh, mustard gas. Everybody knows that mustard gas is a gas. And here this guy is calling it a liquid. Well, let's hear from Sergeant Marrero and see what he has to say. Mr. Homogenes Marrero, Marrero. Immediately after boot camp, I, like I said, after boot camp, I was then was sent to uh, Camp Lejeune where I underwent special training. Uh, this training consisted of chemical weapons, uh, and uh, after that, I was immediately sent to uh, uh, Camp Garcia because I was in Puerto Rico on July, approximately July of 1970. I heard about Project 112. I said, wait a minute. What, what was that? But what did you observe on the island that leads you to believe that that was ongoing at the time you were there? The fact that Shad was written. It was written on, on a lot of documents. What about you know, Project 112? Project 112 was written on, on most of the containers. There was a laboratory there. Quonson Hut, round Quonson Hut, with screen windows on the side. And I, you know, they had two doors, one on one end, one on the other, and there would be a guard standing on both ends of those doors. And why do you describe it as a laboratory? What you can see the Bunsen burners. You see. I observed them uh, working with, uh, on their tape, they had this, uh, it was like a granite table, and it had Bunsen burners, and I would see them actually mixing chemicals. They would pick up the, the containers that they would carry and place them on the table. They would open these containers up, they would put their, their, their uh, equipment on and put on their masks and everything else. They would drape themselves with full food and begin working. And whatever they were working on, I knew it was some sort of liquids because they were in various colors and they would mix them. How is mustard gas destroyed? One way was that they would actually have a, a, a container, uh, a container, and they would use this long, they had this long stick and they would put something on it and they would reach over and put it. Whenever I went there, immediately I would have headaches. I mean, I, I, I vomit. Did you ever, in your in your military um, career, have an occasion to witness the use of mustard gas? On animals. Okay. On animals. And were those animals, was this during the time you were in the Vietnam? Yes, they were. And I observed that the animals would die within seconds upon being exposed. Uh, so I, I, I say that that had to be highly toxic chemicals because the people that were actually conducting the test were wearing 
full suits. These uh, 55 barrel drums that you spoke of, uh, can you describe the markings on some of the Yes, though, some of the markings were hazardous markings. They, they had, they, there was one marking that it was very clear every time I saw it, and it had like, uh, like a U, uh, three U's like this on either side of it. Uh, one of them had triangles. We had a special key that we would release the, the, the pressure inside the 55 gallon drums and every time we release them we have to turn our faces because it, you know, it, it, it's like a, a fume would come out of it. Or you observe the deposit of barrel, 55 barrel drums like the ones you described. These tugboats would come around and the tugboats would take it out to sea. When they came by, we loaded more. So they were getting rid of it at sea. There was a scientist there. This might sound like a big joke or something. But every time that gentleman came on the island, those animals went crazy in the cages. And, and he spoke with an accent. And to me, it was a European accent. I don't know what the accent was. I, I, I have no idea. But every time I, 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 gave him, I gave him a name, and most of the guards gave him a name too. We used to call him Dr. Frankenstein. He didn't talk to never, nobody, he just walked in there and he stayed hours on end. I used to say, when does he sleep? He doesn't sleep. Every man. I used to ask him, they would tell me, no, no, it's harmless, it's harmless. It wasn't harmless. It was not harmless. Why do I, why do I say it was not harmless? Because I would notice animals dead around it. In the evening, sometimes they would say to me, hey, dispose of these animals. And I would take them out to the to the uh, uh, dump area, the what they call the betterero in those days was the dumping area, and I would dump them in there. And if they were still alive, well then I would had instructions to shoot them. His specificity told us as researchers we should dig farther. So we wrote to the National Archives in uh, Maryland, outside of DC, and we asked about Project Shad. And they wrote back and said, as you might imagine, we've received a number of, of uh, questions, inquiries about Operation Shad. For 35 years, the Department of, Dep of Defense has said there was no Project Shad. Well, that still didn't stop us, so we decided we would go to the archives ourselves. Now, <clears throat> students, think about what I just said. I said, go to the library. <laughs> And boy, wasn't it good that we did. This is a very special place. It's in the uh, state of Maryland because uh, Denny Hoyer, who was the senior congressman from Maryland at the time, decided to put the archives in his district. And at the dedication of this building, he said, we dedicate this archive for the transparent transmission of knowledge to all of us because the documents in this library come from a government that is of the people, for the people, and by the people, and the documents of this government belong to the people and not to the government. And it's an amazing place. You get your research card and there it is, we the people. And the building reflects the architecture of the philosophy. It's absolutely wonderful. It's all light. It's all open. It's all welcoming. Come in and learn about your government. Well, that's a great idea. So we took a team with us. And this man on the left is someone who flew over from Copenhagen. He's Danish. And you're going to understand a little bit later in the talk why a Dane would be so interested in the research that we were conducting. And on the right is Ricky Stauber, a munitions ex-DOD um, employee who was working with us on these munitions. <clears throat> it's a daunting task. <laughs> you go to the library, but <laughs> this is where the records are. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, you know. So you use the best resources you can. You hone down the years and the places, the geography, and use their system and we went through, oh gosh, it would have been, uh, you know, hundreds of boxes. And we had been through box number 272 and we hadn't found anything. And there was this box of more things to go through, a stack of more boxes to go through. And then 
prod in box 273, we hit this. Whoa, wait a minute. We not only know that shad is real, we now know what it means. Shipboard hazard and defense. Marrero had not lied. And there it is, Project 112, the same thing. Now, to a librarian, this is the equivalent of being a shark with blood in the water. Whoa, whoa. So that other stack of boxes, we went through every one of those. And that got interesting. So here it was. Project Shad had been on Vieques, and exactly at the time that Marrero said it was there, he had not lied. OK, so let's step back a little bit. By law, these records must be archived. That is a law within the US, constitutional law. They have to be archived. OK, many others had looked for this same material, Shad, but had never found it. So were we just super researchers or what? Well, we got lucky. But also, here's what they had done. It had either not been completely cataloged or it was not cataloged in the same places. That turns out there's a storage facility for the archives and then the archives itself. Not all books in the library are in the library. Sometimes they're in storage. So what they did is they put half the telegram in one library and the other half of the telegram in another. So they had done what they were required to do. They had archived it. But they had archived it in a way that would make it very difficult for us to find. But we found it anyway. So we're plowing through these boxes. And I look over at my fellow researcher, Ricky Stauber, and he's giving me this look. Now, this is not the kind of look you expect to get when you're doing library research. I said, Ricky, what's the problem? He says, I have never seen these four initials next to each other before. And I said, what initials? He said, CC, CC. And I said, what does that mean? Copy it to everybody? And Ricky, the munitions expert, said, no. That means Chemical Corps Caribbean Command. And he said, after 40 years in the US military, I didn't know we had chemical weapons in the Caribbean. But we did. And there it was, the Chemical Weapons Corps in the Caribbean. Now, please understand, we're not talking about conventional munitions. We're not talking about TNT here. We're talking about chemical weapons, the kind that Marrero mentioned as being in Puerto Rico and that he had stored on Vieques. Well, it shouldn't surprise you that every box we were looking into from there on was marked classified top secret. We didn't have clearance for that. But it turns out that if you go to the circulation desk, they have people there who can declassify things right on the spot so that you can see it. Well, it was Christmas time. <laughs> and they had the students from the University of Maryland manning the circulation desk. <laughs> So here was the criteria that the student used to decide whether to declassify the box or not. He blew on the lid. <laughs> and if dust came off, he declassified. <laughs> uh -huh. So we spent the next two days uh, with restricted classified information. But that was officially declassified. So we, I, I, I don't think I'll be shot today. All right. And in those boxes, we found the most horrific information. To the Caribbean and to Puerto Rico had been sent every class of chemical weapon. They had been sent blister agents. That's mustard gas. They had been sent choking agents. That's phosgene. They had been sent blood agents, cyanochloride, and nerve agents, taubin. They had been sent everything to the Caribbean. Now, where did most of this material come from? Most of it originally came from, uh, in World War II, from the Black Forest in Germany, where Hitler had stored chemical weapons. And 
this material was taken out of Germany, it was brought to the United States, and then for reasons that's not entirely clear, it was sent to Puerto Rico. And in 1943, they had 300,000 of this particular munition of mustard gas. And then in 1945, a, uh, a memo went out from the War Department to dump this stuff at sea. Oh, thanks, that's my coral reef, incidentally. <laughs> but, hey, out of sight, out of mind. Um, but this one was interesting. These were their store on Puerto Rico of 60 millimeter, 105 millimeter mustard gas artillery shells. It started out in 1943, we see, but and by 1944 it was down, that's fine. That was when they dumped it. But what's going on here? I mean, it, it, it deteriorated, the stockpiles went down before the dumping at sea. So we're thinking, what in heaven's name was going on there? And then we found this top secret telegram from the War Department that says, huh, oh, by the way, the mustard gas bombs that we sent to you um, have a tendency to leak. <laughs> Sorry, and burst. So, uh, but we don't know what to do with them. But whatever you do, don't store them in a warm environment. Now, wait a minute. This is the this, this, this tropics you sent this stuff to. And we don't know what to do with it. And then, also in the archives, we found this movie that you're about ready to, to see. And I want you to see now another detail from Sergeant Morero. This movie from the Defense Department tells you how to handle mustard, my air quotes, gas. So here we go. And it has a very 1943 look to it, a sound to it. What bombs filled with mustard gas can do to the enemy, they can also do to you. The oily, dark, high persistency liquid of mustard gas demands extreme caution. It will attack any living tissue, skin, eyes, and lungs. So remember, play it safe. Leakage is caused by rough handling, deterioration, or rust, and is most likely to occur at the nose through the joint between the burster well and the body. At inland depots, the bombs are isolated and stowed in igloo type high explosive magazines. The magazines are inspected for leakers every day. Internal pressure will build up during the storage of all types of gas bombs, especially at high temperature. Keep one man outside as a precaution. There's gas in this magazine. On this M70, the detector paint indicates a leak. This one is leaking because of decomposition of the looting on the threads joining the burster well to the body. First, we dig a pit to catch the mustard dripping from the well. Mix earth and dry bleach together in the pit. Two shovels full of bleach to three of earth. Using bleach alone would be dangerous as the mustard might catch fire. Unscrew the burster well slowly. If you hear the hiss of escaping gas, stop work until internal pressure subsides. Carefully, pour the mustard from the bomb into the pit. Note the trough and bottomless pail used to prevent splashing. Drop the empty bomb itself into the pit and cover everything with dry mix. Bombs that are leaking so badly that repair is not possible must be disposed of. Disposal at sea is the safest method, so remember what mustard can do to the enemy, it can do to you. 
Now, mustard gas, liquid, has another special property. As soon as it hits salt water, it solidifies and changes into a solid. Not a liquid, a solid. And it stays on the seafloor for at least a century. This is an example of a ball of mustard gas that has leaked from one of these shells. And this is the arm and hand of a fisherman who has brought one of those shells up. And this is the amputation mark that the doctor has drawn on the arm. Now, you're probably looking at this photograph and saying this does not look like the arm of a Puerto Rican fisherman. In fact, it's not. It is of a Danish fisherman. And the reason being that Bornholm, which is in the Baltic Sea, is very close to where World War I and II chemical munitions were dumped on the seafloor and were drawn up frequently by Danish fishermen, brought on board the vessel where sometimes they explode and sometimes they injure the, uh, the fishermen. Now, I want to remind you that Bornholm is to Denmark as Hawaii is to the United States. It is a state of Denmark. And they take this very, very seriously. And what they have is a program in which they try to get rid of and remove this. It's called Find, Remove, and Destroy. If a fisherman finds one of these mustard gas munitions, they simply call the Danish Navy. The Danish Navy comes to the vessel, removes the, uh, the explosive, and disarms it, and then destroys it. And if the fisherman has lost fish as a result of having to stop for the munitions, they will compensate the fisherman with the, for the catch. And if the boat has been destroyed, they will replace the vessel. So they have a very, very responsible approach to chemical weapons. And this is the result of that kind of thing. Up until 1980, there were many deaths in Denmark from these chemical weapons. But after this program was instituted, they have had no one die since then. There are still deaths of Italians in the Mediterranean as a result of this. Japan has cleaned theirs up. This system of removing chemical weapons and munitions works. We know it works because people have tried it, not in the US, but they have tried it in other countries. Now, it is important to ask, why was this material taken to Puerto Rico? Why would they have stored it there knowing that it should not be stored in areas with elevated temperatures? I had no idea why that was true until I heard this NPR story uh, two years ago. And now you will listen to what the US military was doing with these substances. We've been reporting this week on World War II veterans who were exposed to mustard gas. The men were used as test subjects in secret experiments conducted by the United States military, and that the U.S. military tests singled out minority soldiers. NPR found evidence that black and Puerto Rican soldiers were tested on the theory that dark-skinned men were more resistant to chemical weapons. It's so shocking and so... Um... I don't know, so backward. California Congressman Mike Honda is a third-generation Japanese-American. He says the government needs to take responsibility for what it did in these tests, which were conducted more than 70 years ago. I think that the DOD and uh, even our Congress needs to um, acknowledge that through an apology, a formal recognition of apology, and teach this in our schools. And there needs to be, I believe, some restitution. Congresswoman Yvette Clark from New York is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. She says she plans to lead the charge in making sure these test subjects, who by now are in their 80s and 90s, are compensated. We don't know what turn their lives took. Were they able to be able-bodied individuals in the workforce? How had their families suffered? 
as a result of the exposure to mustard gas. And it's incumbent upon the VA to get to the bottom of it. Florida Representative Gus Bilarakis is the vice chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. He says he's working on bringing in VA officials to testify and has already requested a hearing. You know, we're giving them the funding with regard to the benefits, and we have to hold them accountable. If people aren't doing their jobs, they need to be fired. We are a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Our government must be responsive and responsible to those of us who put them in power. So we went back to the archives to try to find out where this material might have been dumped. And we ran across this extraordinary map in the U.S. archives. It is such an amazing document that I took a video inside the library. And in that library, you're allowed to have cameras. And, and you're going to hear now from Ricky Stauber, the munitions expert who was with us, about the discovery of this map and why it's so important. old material is wonderful. You can feel the age in the paper. There was this map. Again, top secret. But we were given permission to have to use this. Right. The paper was old and aging, obviously, but we opened it up. It is the most detailed topographic map of Vieques ever produced. Most people who live on Vieques have no idea that this map exists. With contour lines at one foot, it showed the elevation of each of these areas. We could only see the whole thing by climbing on a ladder and photographing it from on top. We could see where the water would flow and where it would go. And where the, the significance of this map is that this indicates the, uh, the air base uh, in Puerto Rico where the ammunition depot is located at, which is mapped out here. And this is, we know from the historical documentation that um, chemical bombs uh, were stored on the, ins on in Puerto Rico, so these are, this is the location of where they would have been stored at in this area here. Close proximity to the water, so if we had leakers, this is the areas that we would suspect them to actually dispose of the uh, leaking munitions. And when you're finished, you have to take the map and refold it in exactly the same folds that you had before put it back exactly so that some researcher in the future will be able to access this map as well and then to return it to the librarian who then puts it back in the boxes and in the shelves. We also have report from tugboat operators who were dumping this stuff at sea. They had a designated spot in deeper water, sometimes 300, 400 feet, and that was a nice idea. However, that's not what happened. What the ship's logs show are two things. First, they show that the tugboat was returning to the dock much too soon after it left the dock for it to have transited out to the proper dump site and then gotten back to the dock itself. And we know why as well, because the logs of the ship record that the sailors who were tasked with dumping these chemical weapons were so terrified of what they were handling that they began to throw them off the boat the minute the lines were cast off from the dock itself. And we predict there is a string of these chemical weapons going out towards the dump site, but perhaps ever, not ever even reaching the appointed dump site. So, we know that from our own research that the toxicity of these bombs falls off exponentially as you go away from the bomb. The closer to the bomb, 
The higher the concentration, the farther away from the bomb, the lower the concentration. And what that means, of course, is that this particular pollution has a very special property. It is point source. And that means there's a silver lining here. Pick up a bomb, get rid of the problem. That's it. That's all you have to do. And that's what the Danes do every day. This isn't rocket science. This isn't a mystery. You just do it. Well, you do have a problem. You have to pick up the bomb. <laughs> so, at the University of Georgia, we invented a bomb picker-upper. And here you see it. And we tested it. Now, <clears throat> we like to think of ourselves as very smart people. So, this is a remote control device. I mean, like, we're flying drones now, you know. This is, this is high tech. And these are proportional toggle switches. You move them a little bit, and the grab moves a little bit. You move the toggle switch a lot, it grabs a lot harder. And, best of all, because it's remote control, you get to sit in an air-conditioned room and play video games. So <clears throat> here is my pictures. Again, this is me on the video showing this thing in operation. And I hope you won't mind that uh, in this, the instrument shop that made this put their own little symbol on, Go Dogs up in the upper left. Um, this thing is uh, a machine which is, has a 32-foot radius uh, for grabbing a camera on the front so it can be operated day and night. It has a grab on the end of it, and it can pick up 2,000-pound bombs. Um, and what it does when it does that, it picks them up ever so gently, and then it moves them around in a circle and can take them to a basket, which can then float them to the surface. Now, in this basket case here, we have two scuba tanks on the side, which fill a flotation pontoon on the left. Again, the release is remotely triggered from the scuba tank. Once it's fired, the air from the scuba tank fills this pontoon as it goes up the pressure gets less, it would explode this unless it had an overflow valve, so the air is coming out there as it ascends, and once it reaches the surface, it can be grabbed, dragged off, and either exploded or um, cut into small pieces with a water jet and destroyed, and that's of course how the Danes do it. So, we know what's there, we know where it's located, and basically, we know how to get rid of it. And so, all we're asking from the Department of Defense is to find, remove, and destroy it. And as I said, that's what the Danes and the Japanese are doing every day. This is not rocket science. So, here is my take-home message to every student in this room. Every sample you take has an ethical component to it. Please understand that. Please understand that the research you're doing, and it doesn't matter whether it's in science or literature, the humanities, it will have an ethical component to it. Second, do not allow the polluter to do your science. You are an independent thinker, each and every one of you. You bring your critical thinking skills to the activities that you engage in. And they are yours and yours alone. Don't let anyone tell you. Don't ask that question. Don't use that library. And third, the human dimension to what you do gives meaning to the research that you do. Whether you are elevating the human spirit or investigating the science of ourselves. This human dimension is important. Always include context in your research, not just content. Why are you doing this? Share that. That's the important stuff. Now, as we left Puerto Rico, as you can imagine, the kids will rush up to you and they'll, they'll take your bag and this happened on the island of Vieques and happened in the airport and everywhere. And usually what you do is you give the kid a dollar for helping carry your bag. 
But to a person that was in San Juan, a big city, and in Vieques, the kids would say, no, no necesito. It's not necessary. Don't, no, no, no. Finally, <laughs> I wasn't used to this. <laughs> I said, por qué? Why? And what they said was, usted defendió. Usted nos defendió. You stood up. You stood up for us. Because they understood this was their environment. And the health of that environment was important. Because for us, it is a matter of human rights. Thank you very much for listening. Oh, thank you. I have left enough time for questions, so go ahead. Tough questions, easy questions, doesn't matter. Yes? Have you gone back to the archives again to see if those same <coughs> documents are still there, or have they been reclassified? They were reclassified. And we know that because the green card that said those documents were in the archives and available has now been changed to pink, which means you can't, they're there, but you can't take them out. But in that brief moment of time, on December 22nd and 23rd, we had access to that, and we used them. We, we Xeroxed and uh, archived in PDF form more than 10,000 pages. Oftentimes, we were scanning documents that we had no idea what the content was, but we knew this was our chance to the trough, and we better take it. And we scanned everything. And now, undergraduate research assistants can go through each and every one of the 10,000 pages <laughs> um, looking for terrible things. <laughs> Thank you for that question. More questions. Yes? So there's like the chemical dumping, and there's conventional weapons spawning too, right? There's yes. Two of them. What, when was that happening? Like what's the time range? Above? They overlap. But the striking thing was that so much of the records that we got were from the 1940s. But you heard Sergeant Marrero talking about the 1970s. Supposedly, we didn't have a chemical weapons program. But that isn't true. We, have, we were testing. And that material was dumped off the ACUS. And you know, the Department of Defense continues to say that Marrero is a bald-faced liar. And we're believing Marrero. He was too specific and too correct too often. Yes, question here. Yes, repeatedly. Yes, so they've continued to say I'm a junk scientist. So that was a compliment. <laughs> so what have we done to that? Last week, I was in Washington, D.C. at the National Institutes of Health applying for community health uh, research grant to go back to Vieques. NIH said thank you for being here, we, we are interested in receiving your application. We have one requirement, though. And I said, oh, dear, here it goes. They're going to ask us to work with DOD. And they said, no, that, no. We ask you to work formally with the people of Vieques. So as part of the application process, we're going to fly back to Vieques and get the community organizations and physicians, one of whom you heard of from there, Dr. Carmen Ortiz Roca, will be part of the NIH grant to join us. And this NIH program uh, is especially interesting. It's a community program. It requires that you don't just consult with the people whose lives are affected. You include them as principal investigators in the research. I thought, that's wonderful. That is so respectful. These people have local knowledge, local information. This isn't scientific sort of welfare. This is the opposite. This is getting the good people involved, the little people who happen to know what's there, where it is, and they're going to save us time and make the science better because we're dealing with citizens and not just credentialed scientists. Don't ever underestimate the value of a critical thinking civilian 
to do good work. Citizen science is very important, and this is one where if we don't have access to the health records, we don't have access to anything that we want to know right now. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, the trip to, to NIH was very successful. Yes. Yes, over here. Having been mentioned in multiple uh, news articles in the RCNN, have you consulted with them about what you discovered about your research, or did they just mention you in passing? Um, that, uh, Kemble Brown's piece came out a, a while back. What we've, this, I'm glad you asked that question because I'm also going to, by answering that, I'm going to answer the other thing that this gentleman asked um, about whether we've gone to the Department of Defense or not. We need to get, as a scientist, my attitude is I need to get my ducks in a row. I do my best advocacy work when I come from a position of information and facts. Okay. So when we get those facts, we are then going to give the Department of Defense the option to respond to that, those data. And if they say no again, then we're going to go to the press. But I, I want DOD to do its job first. And that means to, to fund an inclusive piece of science where the, where the citizens direct the scientists. They can ask for funding from Department of Defense, but they can't ask the Department of Defense to do the work. That's what I meant by that second bullet statement, don't let the polluter do your science. Now, it is not as if DOD doesn't have good scientists who could do that. But they're saying, well, don't sample here. Antennae goes up. Don't sample now. Antennae goes up. You cannot ever, as an inquisitive person, be told, don't ask that question, ever. More questions? Yes, sir. Yes, go for it. Over here, and then, yes. The bathymetry maps, yes. the charts of uh, <coughs> Charleston, South Carolina, yes. mark an area yes. of instruction, do not yes. dredge, do not fish here, yes. bombing rain. Yes. It's in 300 to 400 feet of water. Yes. One, it, apart from the advantage of deeper waters, is that a legitimate way to deal? Had they taken those chemical weapons all the way out to the dump site, would your story be different? Okay. That's, first of all, I can tell you something that most, I don't think anyone in this room knows, even someone familiar with that. We, we are aware of that dump site off this state, and it isn't just uh, conventional munitions. I regret to inform you, it's chemical. The second thing I can tell you from our own experience is that there is going to be a line of these materials on the way out to that dump site. And we know this because we've studied Pearl Harbor, where they had the same kind of thing, oh, go out there and dump it. And what you see if you do an underwater remote vehicle camera is this line of weapons and munitions that have been dumped over the side of the barge on the way out to the site. Okay, now 300 feet used to be deep water. It's not anymore. Um, I'm mixed gas certified and um, I've, I've been to 270 feet on air and I've, I've been to much deeper depths with mixed gas, heliox and argon. So, so deep is a relative term. The last part of your question is, would I be satisfied if that's the solution to this? And right now, from what I know, I would say, no, it's not. They need to retrieve, find, retrieve, and destroy it. Now, here's, here's the reason I feel that way. If you look at the history of epidemiology and ecotoxicology, and you look at something like um, asbestos um, or lead, um, or a variety of different toxic compounds. The first time these show up as toxic materials, they tell you <clears throat> they're dangerous in parts per thousand. Then about 10 years of research goes on, and now they say, oh, it's dangerous at parts per million. And then a little bit more research goes on, and they say, oh, it's dangerous at parts per billion. <laughs> well, that's what we're talking about with these things here. So my feeling is for long-term health of the environment, Dumping is never the answer. 
find, retrieve, destroy. Question in the back. Yeah, one more. Go for it. Then we'll get into it. We've got to go ahead and uh, transition sites. We'll take the one last question. Okay, but then if you've got different rooms, as soon as that interchange finishes up, um, it's time to kind of find your next session. Okay? Yes. Yes, it's, it's in the courts, and um, uh, I probably will be called to testify, and I can tell you this. <clears throat> My thought of being uh, on the witness stand tells me that's going to be a lot less fun than being at Sundance. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs> <laughs>